Are you free to be whoever you want to be? Could you be any different than you are? Are we in control of our lives? I spoke with nine leading experts to understand what it means to be free. You can't be self-determining without choice, but giving people more choice does not necessarily make them more self-determining. The regrets, uh, as we define, is really related with uh, our responsibility of our choice. Our regret has to be dependent on the degree to which we did have the freedom or didn't have the freedom. Why do we believe we are in charge? People often ask me, do you believe in free will? And then I say, well, it depends on what you mean. What is determinism? The view that nothing can ever happen otherwise than it does. From the Big Bang to now. Of course there's no free will in the sense that the future is already the, is there. It's just that right now I don't know what it's going to be because I can't compute it. Maybe you think it would be nice if we could make both choices or something like that. We can't. How unfortunate it would be if the way the world is put together, that we are not the authors of our lives. I think I was destined to become a philosophy professor from the time I fell in love with philosophy. There were other tracks that I sort of wish I'd considered more seriously, such as being an engineer. Uh, I love engineering. Uh, and, uh, but I came from a family that was very much in the humanities, either medicine or the humanities. So engineering, if, if I told my mother that I thought I wanted to be an engineer, she would have looked at me as if I'd said, you know, I think I want to be a, a, a lion tamer. Or <laughs> Could Daniel Dennett have become an engineer? Or was he actually always destined to become a philosopher? Was he free? Or was he determined? The notion of determinism comes into the picture whenever uh, human beings in history, and this has happened in many different cultures over time, whenever human beings in history reach a higher stage of self-consciousness where they wonder about uh, um, the origins and the sources of their will and how they got to be the kinds of persons they are and they wonder whether there were factors beyond their control and that they didn't know about that are really affecting their action. So determinism is the general idea that every event that happens has a cause, whether we know it or not. All causes are linked in a chain that goes back to the very origin of the universe or in a theological sense to what Aristotle called the prime mover, who set everything in motion and everything is playing out exactly as it was figured out by the prime mover, as if he was a producer and director and writer of a film and we're watching the movie. And so over, over uh, centuries they have wondered whether uh, we might be controlled by fate or then later the religious issues got into it and whether it would be God or the predestining acts of God. Uh, and then, of course, later it was the laws of physics when modern science came along. In classical physics, Einstein taught us that we should think of time simply as the fourth dimension and this thing called space-time, where time is where nothing ever happens. And time is just the fourth dimension. So if life is a movie, space-time is the entire DVD. In that sense, of course, there's no free will in the sense that the future is already the, is there. Um, it's just that it, right now I don't know what it's going to be because I can't compute it. And then, of course, later with biology, heredity, genes, uh, environment, and then, of course, you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, it was Freud, and, and suddenly we discovered unconscious motives, and could they be uh, influencing us and controlling our behavior? Uh, and then our social conditioning, our upbringing, our parents, our uh, influences in, in our social life, peers and whatever. 
Uh, and, and then in the latest incarnation, which is very hot these days and has been for 20, 30 years, is are we controlled by the neurons of our brain? In other words, the neuroscientists have got into the game. So the uh, experiment that got this no free will ball rolling and that finally attracted the attention of the press, not initially, but it took some years, was done by a neurobiologist named Benjamin Libet. And the earliest studies were done in the early 80s. The Libet experiments were certainly one of these experiments that got everybody thinking about it. And the brain was carrying out activities way before you were consciously aware of it. And therefore, we really were just in this movie that was being calculated and done elsewhere, and we were just experiencing it. But it's always the same story. It's always uh, when we come to be aware of certain factors that may have actually made us into the kinds of persons we are, and we're unaware of them, we don't control them, and then we begin to wonder. And of course, you know, Philosophy begins in wonder. And there's no issue, I think, that people have wondered about more deeply and for as long as this question of whether they really have free will. We don't want to think of ourselves as being pawns in some unknown chess games. If Dennett was determined to become a philosopher, then he never actually could have become an engineer. So does this mean he didn't have free will? It certainly feels that way, but many would disagree, including Dennett himself. I've been fascinated and frustrated to see um, neuroscientists uh, in the sort of lead position, and some evolutionary biologists and some psychologists uh, discovering <laughs> that we don't have free will. Um, and I find this uh, telling uh, because if you look closely, what you find is in almost every case, they take the least scientific, least persuasive, most mystical vision of what free will is and say, hey, we've discovered we don't have, well, you know, we philosophers have been saying that for hundreds of years. Yeah, the scientists are right. That kind of free will does not exist, right? There isn't any immaterial soul in there pushing the buttons. So right, free will doesn't exist in that sense. What about the kinds of free will that are natural, that you can uh, render consistent with a scientific vision? That's where moral competence comes in. Have they got any evidence that human beings in general are not morally competent? Absolutely not. They do have evidence that some people aren't morally competent. We knew that all along. Children, imbeciles, people with serious brain damage, people who have been catastrophically misinformed, obsessive people. There's lots of people who, alas, and often through no fault of their own, don't have moral competence. And we say they don't have free will. And there's nothing mysterious about it. So we can have free will, even if everything is determined, if free will means being a morally competent person. The first thing to notice here is that whether or not we have free will really depends on how we define it. People often ask me, do you believe in free will? And then I say, well, it depends on what you mean. And then we run through different possible meanings. So the first kind, the regular kind is this. If you're sane and rational and well-informed and uh, nobody's threatening you, coercing you, pushing you around in any way, and you make a decision on the basis of good information, that's a free decision. You exercised free will in making it. What we should mean, and the one that matters, the concept that matters, is when we say somebody has free will, what we mean is that they are a morally competent agent. They are able to choose, uh, guided by their reason and their knowledge, 
and we hold them responsible, and they hold themselves responsible. It was an idea, a human idea, that came to into the culture at a time when uh, we didn't have a real deep grasp of uh, how we fit into the natural world, that the idea uh, seems logical for uh, uh, in, instilling the concept of personal responsibility in a culture, in a, in a group of people, that you're responsible for your actions. And uh, you choose freely to do what it is you're doing, and if you do something bad, you're going to be held responsible for it. I don't think it's any more complicated than that. That is compatible with determinism. You can have all that even if the universe is deterministic, even if determinism is true of the universe, because all determinism really is is the uh, thought that the initial conditions of a universe, together with all the laws of nature, entail all other truths about the universe. It's not as though determinism involves some force pushing you around. This kind of free will can fit into a world where everything is determined. This is why it's called compatibilism because it's compatible with determinism. So when we ask the question, was Dennett free to become a philosopher, or was he determined to become a philosopher? The answer can be both. You are free if you are responsible, and you are responsible if you are able to do what you will to do. And that sounds, you know, easy enough. We really shouldn't doubt that we have free will in that sense. But some people think, no, that's not enough because what you need are alternative possibilities of decisions in a really deep way. And to picture the deep way, well, one way to picture it is if you could imagine rolling back time a bit and then rolling it forward without changing anything up until the moment of decision. If you have free will, then if actually you decided to do one thing, uh, you could roll it forward without changing anything before the decision and you make a different decision. Free will is not just free action. This is something I try to emphasize to people because many people simply identify free will uh, uh, with free action. Free action is the ability to do what you will. Uh, and we are not free in this sense when we are, say, coerced or we're acting compulsively or we're incapacitated or we're in jail or someone has us tied down or whatever. When we talk about free will, we're talking about a deeper problem. Uh, and that deeper problem is uh, when you ask the question, not are you free to do what you will, but whence came the will from which you are acting when you act freely, uh, is that will something of your own free making or is it entirely the product of factors uh, over which you had no control and, and so on? How did you get to be the kind of person you are with the will you have? That's the question about free will and you can see it's a much deeper question because a person could be free to act or will as they do uh, and, uh, and not have free will in this sense. Imagine a young man uh, on trial. Uh, he's uh, tried to rob a young woman, and in the process, when she resisted, he, he killed her. Uh, and at first, as we listen to what this young man did, we have deep emotions, resentment and anger against the young man. It's pretty natural. Uh, what he did was horrible. But as we sit in that courtroom over a period of time and we listen to the sordid story about how he got to be the vicious young man that he is, uh, you know, a story of parental neglect, uh, sexual abuse, say, by his father or uncle, or uh, a bad peer pressure, uh, too little love in the home, and all this other stuff. Then slowly, our anger and resentment against the young man begins to shift, and we start to feel resentment and anger against those who abused and made him the way he, he is. But at the same time, our resentment and anger against him doesn't completely go away because we begin to ask ourselves the question, but wait a minute, all these influences were awful, but didn't he still have some chance? Wasn't there something left over for him to be responsible for? You know, this is also natural, something we naturally think about, right? Uh, well, 
as we reason this way, we are now thinking about ultimate responsibility because we are asking ourselves, does the ultimate responsibility for him being the vicious young man he is, are uh, all the result of factors, parents, uh, genes, uh, you know, conditioning and so on over which he had no control, or did he have anything to do with it? And those people that just talk about free action here, they're gonna be satisfied to, to say that, well, look, was he coerced? Did someone hold a gun to his head when he was doing this robbery? Was he, did he act compulsively? Could he do it? Did he think this through? Did he know what he was doing? Did he do this and so on? All these so-called compatibilist criteria can be satisfied in this case. And for many people who are compatibilists, the majority of philosophers and thinkings about this, that's enough. He's guilty if we can eliminate all these other things. Uh, but I say, no, wait a minute, that's not enough. There has to be something left over for us that was not determined by something still earlier uh, when we did act. That's why I am, uh, I believe that free will is not compatible with determinism. This kind of free will is called incompatibilism because it's not compatible with determinism. It's also more commonly known as libertarianism. Free will in this sense isn't just being responsible for what you do, but for wanting what you want. In other words, you are responsible if you are free, and you are free if you are not entirely determined. This is perhaps the more intuitive kind of free will, and this is why determinism naturally feels like a problem. Everyone agrees that if determinism is true, that looks like a big problem for free will. What is determinism? Determinism, very roughly speaking, is the view that nothing can ever happen otherwise than it does, from the Big Bang to now. Determinism is simply the view that, given the past at any given time, and the laws governing the universe, there's only one possible future. If the only thing you could have done was determined by your genetics, your environment, your tracing of causal chain of the worlds, the molecules in your body back forever. If you could only have done the one thing, then what does it mean to say you, you should have done something? Clearly, what's happening is happening to you. You are not making things happen. If we couldn't have done otherwise, then we can't be ultimately responsible for who we are. And therefore, we don't have this kind of free will. You do what you do because of the way you are. Sure. So, to be ultimately responsible for what you do, you've got to be ultimately responsible for the way you are. Step two. Step three. But you can't be ultimately responsible for the way you are. Step four, so you can't be ultimately responsible for what you do. And of course we do have the experience of deciding to change our life and to make ourselves different, and we sometimes do do that. But the reply to that is, well, suppose take two people who both decide to reform themselves. Uh, one of them succeeds, one of them fails. Why? Well, my answer would be, well, the one who succeeded was already a person of such a kind that if they tried to do that kind of thing, they would succeed, whereas the other guy was already a person of such a kind that they would fail. Uh, and then you can add to that various points, but look, no, we know that quite a lot of our nature comes from genetic inheritance. Nobody denies that. Um, we also know that early experience is extremely important. Now people think that when you get older, you can somehow change yourself. But of course, which in a sense you can, but you're always going to be working from the base that you've already got that you were not responsible for. We have to be aware that we're tremendously influenced by our genes and our upbringing uh, and, uh, and so on. The real question is, the medievals had this right. They used the phrase, determined to one, <laughs> meaning only one possible outcome. And that's exactly the right phrase. You could say, if we're, we're determined or causally influenced all the time. But as long as sometimes there's more than one option, uh, which is in the fray. That's what you want. And in order to do that from a scientific point of view, we have to say there was a break in the causal chain that would otherwise have made us predetermined from time zero. 
How could this break occur? Where could it come from? People have been looking for this break for thousands of years. All the way back to Aristotle, he had noted that there were three possible ways things could happen in the world. The first was by a necessity that corresponds to our modern science. The Greek word was ananke, that we are uh, forced to do what we do or an action is forced to happen by laws. The other, however, that he already recognized was that some things could happen by chance. Touke, Tychism it was called, that there were things that were random. However, he thought there was a third possibility, that our actions, especially our moral actions, ones that we thought hard about, were, quote, up to us, or he said, in us. And uh, this notion of being in us really was the thought that somehow the action originated and made what he called a fresh start, arche, a, a, a origination in our own minds. Modern science tended to show that everything followed the first way, determinism. Nothing could happen by chance. So for a long time, thinkers turned to the third option. The break had to come from something else something from inside. And what has happened in the history of philosophy has been such a mystery as to how you could explain free will given exactly the same past that philosophers, great philosophers too, have tried to resolve the issue by introducing some extra factors into the situation that do the job. Like Descartes, you know, uh, with an immaterial soul which would intervene in nature. Uh, Kant introduced a noumenal self outside space and time that would do the deed. You really need to add a supernatural aspect to things. I never have much to say about that one because I don't know how to study, I mean empirically study, what you would need. Relying on a soul means resting, for now, outside the purview of modern science. So how can we get away from determinism without making this leap of faith. In the 20th century, a new field of science was maybe going to provide an answer. It's quite striking how we humans again and again through physics have been led to suspect that reality might be different in various ways when we study not the large but the very small with quantum mechanics. In 1927, Werner Heisenberg found that there was randomness in quantum physics. If you focus a microscope on an atomic particle, we come to find random events, electrons jumping between orbits rather than moving continuously in a deterministic way. And the randomness serves to break the causal chain that the determinists like to argue for. Given the past at any time, there are multiple possible futures. Garden of you know, it's a garden of forking paths. Does that contribute to free will? Well, if you want that mid-grade kind, you're gonna need it. You know, it's so funny, there's a long story here as well. The Epicurean philosophers of old, they were onto this. They said, look, there'll be no, there's no room uh, in nature for human freedom if the atoms don't sometimes swerve from their appointed paths. Quantum physics had potentially given libertarians the key to their kind of freedom, chance. Then the question is, how can indeterminism help? And of course, at first it seems it must be able to help because it's not absolutely strictly determined all the way. There's a kind of, there's a way in for something free. But the trouble with indeterminism is that uh, why does that make me responsible for it? I mean, that's just, indeterminism is luck, as it were, it's not. So that's one of the problems. Why isn't it, as they said to the Epicureans, just chance that you went one way or the other if it's undetermined at that moment? And here's an even deeper problem. Um, if, if indeterminism means, given the past at any given time, there are multiple possible futures, that means you must be able to have chosen voluntarily to do this or voluntarily to do the opposite, given exactly the same past leading up to your choice. Exactly the same thoughts, the same emotions, the same feelings, and so on, could do different. 
a tremendous paradox. It isn't ultimately coherent. If everything's determined, we, we, we understand the sense in which that's a problem. If things are indetermined, well, that's just throwing luck into the, into the equation, and that doesn't make you responsible. Either way, you can't be fully responsible. So free will is not, in the strong sense, is not possible. When talking about free will, the first thing to understand is that there really are these two different views of freedom. There's the compatibilist free will that can exist in a deterministic world, and there's the libertarian free will that requires some real randomness. The disagreement over which one is the real meaning of freedom is itself a major debate in philosophy. I'm officially neutral on the compatibilism versus incompatibilism dispute, but I find libertarianism uh, fascinating, much more interesting theoretically. That kind of people, there are some philosophers who believe in it or think it's important, but they're, they're really the minority. Uh, most philosophers who've thought hard about this are, like me, compatibilists. Freedom exists in the sense that you are free to make the best choice possible depending on the quality of information you receive. It, 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 full stop. The age-old, it's thousands of years old, idea that in order for us to have free will, indeterminism must reign, we must have the random swerve. It's, it's a tempting, seducing idea, and it's simply wrong. This is, of course, the stuff of modern debate. There are many people, especially philosophers of science, who just love to debate this thing. I like to quote uh, the uh, a medieval Islamic uh, Sufi poet and philosopher, Jalaluddin Rumi, a 13th century. He says, there is a disputation that will continue until mankind is raised from the dead between the necessitarians and the partisans of free will. <laughs>